I'm so excited to be in Montana. This book came out in the middle of 2020, and that obviously like wasn't the time I was getting to travel a lot and talk about it. Um, so I'm trying to make up for it this summer. I've been in Montana since the beginning of the month. Started in Bozeman, and where did I go? I went to Cody, I went to Red Lodge, I was there making a bunch of sandbags in Red Lodge for a couple days. Um, Billings, Helena, I was just in Virginia City. Um, I'm thrilled to be back in Butte. I did do a little bit of the research for Race in the Wild West here in the Butte archives. You'll see the subtitle of the book includes the Montana Vigilantes. And of course, vigilante tourism is alive and well in Montana. And the archive here has some great stuff about vigilante tourism in the 1920s and 30s um, that was helpful. So. It's great to be back, and thank you for spending a beautiful afternoon outside, inside, with me. Um, Sonia, I heard some chattering before about Virginia City. Who's been to Virginia City? Well, who hasn't? <laughs> Most of y'all. Who's heard of Sarah Pickford? I don't know. Amazing. We'll talk about her a little bit more. Um, so I always like to open just so any talk that I do about Sarah Bickford by talking a little bit about how I came to this story, because it is really personal to me, and I think that can be a powerful way for us to kind of think about the history and the history that resonates with us and the history that's important. Um, in a lot of ways, this is a book about the Wild West I grew up really wanting to believe in. I grew up in California, but it was like rural California. I lived on my grandparents' ranch that they had been operating since the 1940s. And it was right in that really strange cusp of time when we were still pretty isolated out there. We didn't have television. We only had running water about 50% of the time. We had like an old rotary telephone that was on a party line until I was four or five. Um, so I really grew up having these kind of unique experiences that a lot of people my age don't necessarily relate to, right? I didn't get to watch all the cable TV shows or um, have the video games or like the technology. That's something that was pretty common um, for a lot of my generation. And I think kind of the clearest sort of illustration of this, the Silicon Valley boom was just getting started, of course, when I was a kid in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And so we were out there still like farming with a team of horses. I would go out and plant pumpkins with my grandpa every year with a big team of draft horses. And our nearest neighbor was flying in and out in a helicopter. I think he invented QuickBooks or something. So. Um, it was a really kind of a unique upbringing. But in the midst of that, you know, I was raised with all these ideas of the Wild West and what the Wild West was supposed to have been and the Cowboys and Indians and Buffalo Bill kinds of stories. Um, and so a lot of this book was really a journey for me in thinking about what the grains of truth in those stories were and how they resonated and why a story like Sarah Bickford you know, reaffirmed a lot of the things I felt about the Wild West, but also challenged other things that I felt about the Wild West. Um, and I just want to illustrate this really quickly. So this image here is my grandfather, John Arata, and it kind of sums up, you know, the the image that I have of him in my head, where we were living on a ranch, we had cows, we raised hay and grain. Um, that was helpful knowledge, actually. Swinging a grain sack is not all that different than swinging a sandbag, so <laughs> some muscle memory was coming back um, last week in Red Lodge. Um, but this is the ranch that we lived on. You can see it in the background. It's kind of rolling hills, and there's a cattle barn right behind him here off to the side. And my image of him was always as this you know, sort of cowboy styled after Buffalo Bill. Um, and it took me a long time after both he and my father had passed, and I started doing some research on my own family history to uncover how much of that he'd constructed 
for himself. Like he'd made a leap from being a Portuguese Italian day laborer to trying to become this all American cowboy by the time I was growing up. I met one of my great aunts after he passed and I showed her this picture and I was like, this is how I remember grandpa and she went, sweetie, he didn't have time to be a cowboy when we were growing up, but let me tell you about the still they blew up behind their house when I was five. Real life. Yeah, so I, it raised a lot of questions for me and in a lot of ways investigating Sarah Bickford's story and thinking about race and the Wild West has helped me start to excavate my own family history, which is Portuguese and Italian and Irish. Um, on the coast of California at a time, you know, when maybe the, uh, those ethnic groups wouldn't have been considered totally white, right, back in the early 1900s. Um, and then just to, you know, I always like to drive home, I come at the story of the Wild West from a place of, I would call it attachment and participation. Um, so just in fairness, there's my grandpa on a horse, um, and here's me on a horse participating. <laughs> like this was our last, this was our last rodeo. That horse threw me into a fence. Oh. Right after this, my back has never been the same. But that was our best time. So, um, but you know, so I grew up really like wanting to participate in this world of the Wild West, and it kind of felt to me like it was already lost. You know, by the time I was growing up, because you had the Silicon Valley growing up right there next to us and all of a sudden the dynamic of who lived in that part of California was changing. Um, so when I went off to grad school with not really a lot of idea what I was doing, like I didn't have a clear idea that I wanted to become a historian, I just knew I really liked old things. And I had a chance to go to Virginia City, my very first semester of grad school for a little field school that was happening. Um, and I remember telling my brother that I was going to go to Virginia City, this like, place in Montana that I had never heard of. I had never been to Montana at that point. And he got very excited about it. He was like, oh, it's old. It's like very Wild West. You're going to love it there. <laughs> it was not incorrect. Um, so here I am on my very first adventure in Virginia City in 2007. Um, and it was this amazing moment of learning that like the history was something I could hold in my hands. It was physical. I was getting to see these traces of people who had been there before. Here we're working on a floor in an old building that we were taking up layers of so it could be stabilized. Um, but the thing that really resonated with me about this trip to Virginia City, right? This is Virginia City roughly today. If you go there today, this is just about what it looks like, right? This is one of my photos from that early trip. Um, and I just remember you know, walking down the sidewalks in this place and trying to take it all in and really feeling like, okay, I've stepped back into what I always felt like I wanted the Wild West to be. And a Wild West that I didn't have a chance to experience and neither did my grandpa. I think I, I grew up sort of having this vague idea that he had like stepped right out of it, and of course like that was not the case. Um, but it did very much feel like walking into a place that had things that could teach me about what the Wild West had really been. So my first attachment was to this place, right? And Virginia City is still very near and dear to my heart because I just got back from there yesterday. And it was great to spend a little bit of time there. So we'll come back to that photo in a minute. Um, so on my very first trip to Virginia City, and this is, we'll get to race in the Wild West now, like everybody else, I had to wander into the Hangman's Building, who's been inside the Hangman's Building. A lot of you, so it's a combination space, right? It's the water company office. It's also interpreted based on the famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, moment in 1864 when a bunch of guys came together and said, you know what, there's entirely too much law breaking happening in this territory, we're going to put a stop to it. And they become known as the Montana Vigilantes at the end of a series of lynchings that left 22 people dead in 37 days. It's 
still today, a lot of historians consider it the bloodiest single episode of lynching in American history, although it has some competition. There's some quibbles with that designation. Um, but like, who here has heard of the Montana vigilantes? Yeah, I don't have to explain to a Montana crowd about the Montana vigilantes, right? They're everywhere. They're still such a present story, and I mean, super present in Virginia City. You go there. Um, so I encountered this building just kind of like everybody else does, where there's sort of one framed um, informational piece on the wall that talked about Sarah Bickford and. When I started going to Virginia City in 2007, everything we knew about her fit on like one typed page, but not even a full typed page, just like, you see it here. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, half a page of information and the basic contours of that story were, you know, she's a black woman, she came to Montana in the 1870s, she had a first marriage and three children, she had a second marriage and four children, that's pretty well established. And then she ran the water company, and her business ended up in this building. And it was treated as very sort of coincidental that her business had ended up in this building. And then there were so many unknowns in the midst of that. It wasn't clear if she'd come, some sources said Tennessee, some said North Carolina. There was a lot of confusion as to where she started. Um, no one seemed to know the names of two of the three children from her first marriage, it wasn't clear who her first husband had been. There's a lot of sort of rumors about him. Um, and then it was always kind of treated as, well, she happened to acquire this building. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I learned about Virginia City over the course of the next couple of years. And well, that doesn't really sound like the Sarah Bickford I'm getting to know. And so I always kind of wanted to know more about this story. Um, just a couple more refresher images. I imagine these look pretty familiar to quite a few people in here. So just go pretty quickly, but just basically what it looks like today. There's a little desk interpreting her water company office. And then I imagine a lot of you have taken note of there's different interpretation of Montana vigilantes um, throughout this building. And of course it has those connections as well. It's um, so like they have a copy of the vigilante oath that's interpreted. There's a little monument to James Williams, who was a vigilante captain. And <clears throat> all I would look at there is, I mean, just compare it to how much text was available about Sarah Bickford and then how much is available about the vigilantes. We know a lot more about the vigilantes. Um, and there's this little diorama that maybe some, who's seen the diorama. It's very detailed, right? It's very intricate. Um, depicting this building and the central beam, which of course forms a cornerstone of vigilante legend where five men were hanged side by side in January of 1864. Um, hence the name, right? And it used to be, if you went in, you kind of sit here in the background, there was a mannequin that they were sort of interpreting as Sarah Bickford's son from her second marriage. His name was Elmer, and he did run the water company for quite a while. Um, but it was a very, especially for me as a young grad student who still didn't understand a lot of the history of Montana or race, um, that I was still learning. It was very jarring to see this scene of a lynching that's really celebrated. Montana history, and then this mannequin of an African-American person, and they're not connected. Right? Elmer wasn't alive when this happened. There wasn't really any interpretation of Elmer Bickford, and you know, I just like always wanted to know more about this story. Uh, and you know, of course, if you've been there, you can still see the beam. And I remember just being very struck by this, right? That. Sarah Bickford's desk is right under this beam. She would have looked up every time she was in there and known it was there. And it just raises a lot of questions, right? That there didn't seem to be any forthcoming answers to at that moment. So I kind of filed this away. Um, and a long story short, I only intended to get a master's degree 
that was my only plan. I was going to stop after that. I didn't really know what I was getting a master's degree for, but I was committed at that point. Um, but I had fallen completely under the spell of Virginia City. I wanted to go back to Virginia City the second I left. Um, and I ended up writing my master's thesis about Virginia City, and I framed it in terms of two stores that are still there that maybe you've seen, the SR Buford General Store and the Hannah and Mary McGovern Store. And I was fascinated by the business and how people got goods and supplies into Virginia City and what people were buying and what kinds of things they were, you know, having access to in Virginia City that seemed a little incongruous with being on a mining frontier like linoleum. A lot of the buildings in Virginia City have this really old linoleum in them from the 1890s. And that was a kind of material culture thing that I could trace back and I got very invested in the historic preservation. Um, here I am digging through some old periodicals in an old building and it was just like the greatest thing ever that they would let me into all these old buildings and let me dig around and stuff. Um, so it really did like transform my life coming into this place. I actually had thought I was going to study World War II as a master's <laughs> student. So this really like shifted my trajectory. Um, and just like for a note of context, I was gonna study World War II. I had lined up an internship in Alaska. So I actually went straight from Virginia City, flew to Kodiak, Alaska, where I was the natural history interpreter at Fort Abercrombie State Park, where they still have a lot of World War II artifacts, pillboxes, and bunkers, and I got to help run a little World War II Alaska Military History Museum that had artifacts from Atu and Kiska, those two islands way far out in the Bering Sea chain that were Japanese occupied for a couple of years in World War II. I did some oral <coughs> histories with a couple of World War II veterans who were returning to Alaska. Um, and it was amazing, it was this wonderful experience. And the second I got off the plane back in Washington State, I went, mm, I have to go back to Virginia City. <laughs> and I climbed into the Ford F-250 V10 Super Duty pickup that was my daily driver at that point. Um, grew up on a ranch <laughs> and headed back to Montana and it just, you know, that, that place has never left me. So in this whole master's thesis, and I ended up writing, it was really long. The master's thesis is like maybe 80 to 100 pages, and I think I wrote about 300, and my advisors were thrilled when they got done reading it. Um, but in that whole 300 pages about business and material culture in Virginia City, Sarah Bickford ended up in a footnote, because that was all the information I had about her was this one single footnote that this African-American woman had run the water company and I got come towards the end of my master's degree and I was still thinking about it, that footnote was still just irking me, right? Like, um, and I started thinking, if someone had suggested only you could get a PhD and work on Sarah Bickford. Well, I mean, PhDs are for smart people, like I don't really know what that means, actually. It's never occurred to me that I could get a PhD. Um, but long story short, I did set out on this research journey because Sarah Bickford deserved more than a footnote in Montana history. And I think it's a really powerful lesson in terms of just thinking about how one decision, one chance encounter with the history can reshape a whole life. I mean, no doubt I would not be where I am today at Oklahoma State University or here chatting with you if it hadn't been for that moment. Let's try to slip it in when I talk about how this book came to be. So just really, really quickly, we just had Juneteenth a couple of days ago. I always like to slip in just a little bit of contextual history. Um, and I'll sort of go quickly. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. Um, but one of the challenges that I ran into in trying to put together this book is that African American women can be really hard to find in United States history, and there's sort of a double marginalization at work. 
sources aren't recorded because they're African American or they're not preserved because they're women and that's pretty common. It's common also with like Chinese women in archives. Any women or different ethnic groups are recorded differently and Butte, right, has such a complex, interesting, like multi-layered, multicultural history um, that we could talk about all day, right, what it takes to start excavating and examining those different histories. Um, and it's just part of being a historian, right? You figure out what your challenge is and then you, you know, sort of dive in thinking about how you're going to overcome it. Um, and so I decided you know, pretty early on that I probably wasn't going to find a ton of sources about Sarah Bickford. And sources by Sarah Bickford are extremely few and far between. Um, but Virginia City was there, and I knew I could reconstruct the world around her. So I thought, okay, well, I'll tell a story about Virginia City, and I'll see where she fits. And, you know, I'll deal with the challenges as I come to them. And so African American history in Montana just generally is challenging just because relative to the total population, we're talking about a small number of people. Black Americans have never been more than about 1% of Montana's population. Even as numbers of African American residents rise throughout the 19th century and into the early 20th century, the total population of Montana is also growing. So stays pretty consistent at about 1%. Um, but if we really go back and dig through the history, African Americans are present in a lot of these big moments in Montana history. They're present at the gold strikes that found probably Virginia City, definitely at Helena. We know for sure there's a black person at the gold strike that found Helena. I found traces of African Americans in vigilante literature. I'll talk about one of those in just a second. Um, we know they're at miners courts. They're operating businesses. And Butte actually has a thriving at points, African American business community of barbers and restaurants and boarding houses. Um, so to Virginia City and Helena, there's a few other places. Um, and I think it's really important that we keep in mind at this moment that we're kind of starting to excavate here when Sarah Bickford arrives in Montana in the 1870s. The rights of African Americans and lots of other ethnic groups are still not fully defined yet. Right? We're in the middle of the Civil War. The country's tearing itself apart, and there's all these lingering questions about what rights different groups of people are going to have. And none of those questions have been settled yet. The war is still being fought. So it's a moment when there's a lot of hope and opportunity and unanswered questions that are still lingering. Um, so vigilantes, really quickly, I just like to toss this in because it's you know one of those moments where we can take a really well-known story like the vigilantes that doesn't seem at face value like it has a whole lot to do with race. Um, this is one of the ways I argue in this book, the vigilantes get to become the sort of pillar of tourism and wild west Montana history is, for the most part, it's white men lynching other white men and that kind of puts it into safer territory to talk about it as the wild west rather than, you know, the other side of lynching in American history is race-based lynching, which is also becoming an increasing factor um, and race relations at this point. Uh, but so there's a little moment in the early literature on the vigilantes that talks about a miners court trial that was taking place in Virginia City and there were you know, people gathered and they're trying to vote on the fate of these three men who, at least two of the three of them, ended up being executed later by the vigilantes. And they couldn't decide. It was a split vote. It was not clear what the crowd wanted, a hanging or a banishment. Um, and the story goes, as it's related in Dimsdale's Vigilantes of Montana, the first famous book on the vigilantes, first book printed in Montana territory, mm -hmm. actually. Um, so finally, they picked you know, two groups of two, and they had 
these two groups of two men go in different directions and then they directed the crowd to walk physically through them to have their vote recorded for hanging banishment in this miners trial and at one point according to Dimsdale there's an Irishman who stands up and says hey there's a black man who just voted three times <laughs> And the crowd is, you know, like not sure what to do with this information. He's probably not the only one. He's just the first one who got caught, right? And Dimsdale kind of writes this off and says, well, and then so that guy like ran for the creek and everybody else was still like not sure what to do about it. And some women showed up and they were crying and like causing a scene. So we banished those guys and well, that's the end of the story. And so one way to read that, like it's kind of a funny story, right? This guy got caught voting twice. But if we dig a little deeper into it, it's like, well, there's a black man in Virginia City really early in history where we don't have a census where we could look for his name. He's someone who quite literally can be just lost in history. He's there for a fleeting moment. And how would we ever find this person again if he's moved on somewhere else by the time there's a census six or seven years later? Um, but he clearly feels empowered in that moment to participate. Right? This crowd that he is standing amongst in Virginia City is at least open enough that he feels confident that he can vote in these proceedings. And that might tell us something. One of the rumors about Montana vigilantes is that the vigilantes list towards the radical Republican side of the Civil War, and a lot of the guys they execute seem to be Confederate sympathizers or copperheads. And you know, maybe, maybe there's a moment in there where that sort of radical Republican impulse is winning and a black man feels right, like he can participate in this process. So it does raise those questions about Montana history still being in the making, right? It's not decided yet. Um, so just to kind of sum up on this, how it plays out over time, um, as Congress is debating splitting off Montana territory from Idaho, because the whole territory is kind of big and unwieldy at this moment in time in 1863, um, there's a question about are we going to allow African Americans the right to vote in this new territory? We're fighting a bloody civil war. The Emancipation Proclamation has happened all of a sudden now, right? The rights of citizens of the United States are being debated. It's not clear how African Americans are gonna be included in that yet. Those conversations are still evolving. Um, and someone says, well, I mean, there's not any African Americans in Montana territory that we need to worry about. It's an academic question. And someone else is actually Nathaniel Pitt Langford, also a vigilante. Right, writes a famous book about the vigilantes who says, well, no, one of the most respected men in the territory is a black man, and they call him the $50,000 Negro because he owns these mining claims that are worth like tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and so they end up kind of putting off the question, right, and saying, well, maybe there's African Americans there. We'll let the state decide. We'll put it off to the next moment. Uh, so just Right, kind of a side note to bring this back, when I first started researching Sarah Bickford, a lot of the sources said her husband was the $50,000 Negro. And that's who she was married to. Um, that was the story when I started going to Virginia City. And it turned out not only was that not her husband, but her first marriage had been considered an intermarriage. Her husband was Irish. She was black. His name was John Brown, no relation to the famous abolitionist John Brown. Um, and John Brown was brutal. John Brown beat her severely. They had three children together. All of their children from that marriage died. Sarah Bickford ended up successfully divorcing him in 1880, which was not particularly common at that time for a woman to be able to sue for a divorce and get it and especially a black woman to be able to sue for a divorce and get it. So all of a sudden, right, this one, this one instance opens up the whole story, Sarah Bickford. Um, so a couple things that shaped this book as I was writing, I always have to throw these in kind of towards the end. Um, I did have people tell me, right, you're looking for a needle in a haystack, 
you are never going to find the sources to write that book. In fact, I had one advisor tell me, it'll be career suicide if you try and write that book. <laughs> I think about him often. <laughs> oh, snap. Um, but a lot of people said this to me with very good intention, right? Just that you're going looking for this really narrow story. It's going to be hard to find sources. You're going to have to think about broadening out. How are you ever going to tell that story? And you know, a lot of the sources that did show up early on were kind of fragmentary. Like here's an example. And you'll notice her name is Sally Brown here. So I figured out by this point her husband's name is John Brown. I learned a little bit about him. So I know this is her. Sally's a common nickname for Sarah at this time period. Like Sally Hemings is another great example of a black woman using Sally as a nickname for Sarah. Um, and you know, so this is interesting. It tells me Sarah's running a little restaurant and bakery. She's maybe we're just talking about pies and confections before the talk started. So she's baking all those things. She's running a little boarding house. Uh, and that's great, like it's interesting to know that she was doing this, but how do I write a whole book? <laughs> how do I write a whole book about this? Really hard. Um, but, at the same time there were these really tantalizing sources, so I had gotten a little research grant to go to Tennessee and try and do some research, because nobody knew where she was from, right? The sources kind of had a, a couple different leads. And I thought, well, okay, I'll try. Right? I'll go there and I'll, I'll try. I'll see what I can track down. And I remember I was a very young baby grad student. At this point, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and I remember walking into this archive in Tennessee, just showing up, you know, and saying, hello, I'm looking for this single woman who I'm pretty sure was enslaved, and I think one of these two families owned her, and she might have been from here, but maybe North Carolina. But anyway, please help me find sources. <laughs> And just watching the light drain out of this archivist's eyes for a minute, where she was like, well, oh, this is going to be such a long day for me. OK. But you know, bless her. Always be nice to the archivists. You never know what they're going to help you dig up. Um, so we found the census for 1860, which at that point meant you're still having to look at microfilm. The internet had not hooked us up with this yet. Um, it's become a lot easier to do some of this research since right, 2007, 8, 9. Um, but this is really fascinating. So this is the census for Washington County, Tennessee, where I kind of thought maybe Sarah Bickford had started out. I had two family names I was researching. One of them was Blair, had a really good sort of indication that her last name was either Blair or Gammon. And her divorce record said Sarah Blair. Right? So then I've got like a, you know, kind of a confirmed name that's in a legal document that I can work with. Um, so this is 1860. Now 1860 is interesting. There's still two censuses for the United States in 1860. There's Schedule 1, which is like a census we'd have today. Free inhabitants lists your name, your age, where you're from, members of your household, occupation, right? All that sort of statistical, vital data. Um, that's usually collected in a census. And that's Schedule 1, right? Free inhabitants. There's also a Schedule 2 for slaves, specifically. And Schedule 2 only records four things. Schedule 2 recorded an age, a color, a sex, and a dollar amount. It didn't even record people's names. Schedule 2 is meant to be dehumanizing. Schedule 2 is meant to be a record of property. And you can imagine, like, I might find an eight-year-old girl in roughly the right place, you know, who could be her, but if I don't have any names attached to it, how do I possibly excavate? But something interesting happened here in 1860. This census enumerator, William Crouch, bless him, he also has really good handwriting, which is always a factor <laughs> when you're looking at old documents. <laughs> He went through and for whatever reason, he enumerated every single slave in Washington County. And I know that's what was happening because we see right here, here's a bunch of Blairs. And they're all living in a hotel and boarding house that's owned by a man named John Blair in Jonesboro, Tennessee. 
And he's recorded their ages and their right names, male or female, if they're black or mulatto. And he's made himself this little extra column and written an S there, which I assume stands for slave, because then you can see somebody else has come in and crossed all this out and written schedule two hmm. in the margin. Hmm. And right, I still get chills. Um, here's Sarah. Right here is a little eight-year-old girl named Sarah Blair. And I did end up with two possibilities for her. This is the John Blair house. John Blair also had a brother named Robert Blair. They lived really close together. And Robert Blair also had a slave girl named Sarah living in his household who's about the same age. So it's one of those two. But I know she's owned by the Blair family. Um, and that becomes an interesting story, too. John Blair was a United States congressman, which is great for me, because it means there's a lot of information about him and his household <laughs> in the historical record. He's a bitter political enemy of Davy Crockett. Mm -hmm. And they're from the same roughly kind of part of Tennessee, right? So when Davy Crockett gets up in Congress and is like, y'all can go to hell, I'm going to Texas, he's talking to John Blair. What a fun connection to very early Wild West history. Right, that shows these really like unexpected places. Sam Bickford probably grows up here in those stories, right? When she's a kid, fascinating. Um, but so once I was able to pin down a place, right, I can put her in Jonesboro, Tennessee, by all these sort of little faded blips in the historical record. Now I can trace where she's traveled, right? And then when you look at this map, it really is kind of breathtaking. This is a period in American history where most people don't travel more than 50 to 100 miles from the place they're born. That's really common. That you're born and raised and spend your life kind of in one place. And look at this journey that she's on across the country that she takes in the winter of 1870. She would have come into Virginia City in January by sleigh, probably never having seen that much snow before. Um, and she's about 14 or 15 when she takes that journey. So that tells us something about the kind of intrepid person that she is. Now I'm starting to reconstruct a bigger story. Um, and then I came across one other source, and it kind of summed up in the words of, so we had the career suicide advisor. You'll never find the sources to write that book. And I was sort of lamenting to a different advisor, what if I can't do it? Right? What if I just can't find enough sources to write this? How am I ever going to shift gears? I'll never finish this PhD. What am I doing? <laughs> and I remember her saying, like, really, you know, caring. Well, I can tell you really care about her. I can tell you really care about Sarah Bickford. And if you care that much, you kind of owe it to her and yourself to see how far you can get with writing that story. And then I found another little source. And you always have to share this, right? Because it's also a snippet. It's also a little fragmentary piece of the record. Um, so I was looking for something else. I had sort of given up for a minute on writing this story. And I was trying to get recentered. And I was working on an article about tourism related to the Vigilante Trail and the Nez Perce Trail. Because I was fascinated by those events. They're like terrifying when they're happening. But then eventually they become grounds for tourism, and that's where my Butte archives came in, right? Tourism of the Vigilante Trail. Um, and so you'll see up here, right, it's 1877. I'm digging around looking for stuff on the Nez Perce War in 1877. And of course, it unsettled a lot of people in Montana territory, so the newspapers are talking about it. Um, and I stumbled across this, right? So it's just a little obituary. Right. In this city on Monday, December 24th, 1877, James Leonard, son of Mr. and Mrs. John Brown, aged two years and six weeks, so he's died. I remember having a moment, I was like, wait a minute, where's my census records? Are there any other Browns? Because I know I'm looking for a son of Mr. and Mrs. John Brown somewhere in here, and it, there weren't any others that it could be. And I remember sitting there having a moment when I said, okay, well, now I know his name is James Leonard, right? And none of the sources have given me that information. None of the sources knew what her son's names were. And so I was sitting there saying, okay, well, I have the chance to give him back his name. 
I'm sure people are repeating that name. And I think for Sarah, growing up in slavery, that was probably pretty deeply important, right? Think back to our Schedule 1, mm -hmm. Schedule 2. And the other thing that jumped out at me, right, it gives his date of death here is December 24th, 1877. Sarah always gave her birthday as December 25th. So this is the day before her birthday, her two-year-old son is dying. And the other like place that's really got me, this is 1877. Right? Here she is on the 1880 census for Virginia City with her living daughter, Ava, giving her age as 24, right? So she's so young when this is happening. And of course, you know, Ava is living here, but this daughter is also going to die just a few months mm -hmm. after this. Um, so then all of a sudden, that tells me a lot about Sarah Bickford, right? That tells me a lot about what this woman went through. And of course, she came back. She spends the rest of her life in Montana. So now I can kind of reconstruct a little timeline for her. So her first 10 years in Montana, right? She arrives in Virginia City. She marries this Irish immigrant named John Brown. He's super abusive. I have a lot of suspicions about why Sarah Bickford is attached to the legend of the vigilantes, and I think John Brown may be a part of that. Um, we have the death of her son, James. She has another son who I think is named William, who I think maybe died kind of at birth. One of my guesses is that maybe James and William are twins, and one of the twins lived. It was very hard to find records for that. Um, 1880, she gets a divorce. 1881, her daughter Ava dies. So this is her first 10 years in Montana. She's had a whole family, lost a whole family, gotten married, gotten divorced. She's still like 24 years old. I'm sitting there at my microfilm machine going, wait a minute, I'm like 24 years old. What have I done? I sat in here and cried in front of this microfilm machine for like the last 10 minutes. Um, but that was kind of the moment when I was committed. Like, you know, okay, career suicide be damned. I'm going to write this book and see where it takes me. Um, so when you pick up a copy of Race in the Wild West, which I hope you will leave with, that was really the energy coming from behind it of saying, okay, well, I owe it to her. Um, and the next several decades of her life get much happier, right? So we don't end on a total like sad note. So she leaves Montana for a little bit in 1881. She goes and visits friends in Tennessee. So she's able to travel all the way across the country by herself at that time period, which is also kind of crazy. Um, then she comes back. She comes back to Virginia City. She marries a second time, a man named Stephen Bickford, who's also a white man. Um, and they have a much happier partnership. It seems like from all the things we have, they're true partners. They support each other in different business ventures, and she supports him in mining ventures. He supports her in various ways, and they at least have a stable right, relationship. They have four children. All of those children live, outlive their parents, live until well in to the middle part of the next century. There's living descendants of those children that I've been able to talk with since the book came out. So Sarah has grandchildren who are out there. Um, and so that's amazing, right? That's a much happier side to this story. And then in 1900, Stephen Bickford dies. and. Sarah inherits his two-third shares of the Virginia City Water Company, which she's probably been running for him since 1888, because he's off mining for months at a time. Somebody's got to be there running the business. 1917, she acquires what's now known as the Hangman's Building, very intentionally, as it turns out. Automobile tourism and heritage tourism is on the rise in Montana. The Thompson Hickman Museum is being built right about that time period. I'll show you a couple pictures in a second of how Virginia City is marketing itself. Um, and she really does become an entrepreneur of taking on that tourism. And one of the ways I know that's very intentional is because she's actually the one who exposes the hangman's beam in the ceiling. It had been covered up. They covered it up and made that building a whole bunch of different things after those events in 1864. And Sarah's the one 
who cuts a little trap door in there so she can open it and close it for tourists. And there's kind of an apocryphal story about her. I'm like never going to find evidence to prove it, but the rumor is out there, and it, I buy it. Um, that she would keep a coil of rope under her desk, and when tourists would come in, she would like snip off little pieces and be like, original, 10 cents. <laughs> Sell them these vigilante souvenirs, so they go way back. Um, yeah, and so she's going to do that until her death in 1931. So she's got this really kind of incredible 30 years from 1900 to her death, where she's the first and probably the only black female public utilities owner in the United States. And she's promoting tourism inside of a lynching yeah. for part of that. And Sarah is very aware of race. She subscribes to all the periodicals. Um, she actually comes to Butte quite a lot and brings her children to Butte. Her daughters have friends who live in Butte. Mm -hmm. The daughters come here. Their friends from Butte go to Virginia City and spend weeks at a time with Sarah Bickford's children. Um, and Sarah talks about how she wants them to know people of their own race. Like she's very aware that even though they're half white, they're going to be treated as if they're African American, no matter what they do. Right? Um, and so she's very aware of all those things. There's a, a black paper in Butte for a long time that Sarah subscribes to. that we know is showing up at her house. So she's certainly aware of the turn that race-based lynching has taken in the places where she is from, back in Tennessee, right? They're carrying reports of race-based lynchings in those places. And so that kind of throws an uncomfortable but fascinating wrench in our understanding of the Wild West and this tourism, right? That it's Sarah who's out there saying, well, I'm gonna promote this vigilante tourism. And I have my suspicions um, on that. But you know, the more I think about it, the more well, there's, it shouldn't be uncomfortable. She's making a choice. You can ask a lot of questions about it. Um, but isn't that what the Wild West is all about? This freedom and opportunity that you can be anything you want to be. You just find the niche for yourself. That's the promise of it. That's why we're still fascinated with the Wild West. It's the Wild West I grew up with, so maybe it's not that different from Sarah's Wild West. Um, so just really quickly, I promised I would end with this. I just gave a talk in Helena for Juneteenth, and we had a little celebration of Juneteenth with ice cream out on the Montana Historical Society lawn afterwards. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that is because it's actually black women who provide ice cream to Montana Territory for a lot of years for the 4th of July celebrations that are happening, that are just around the corner. Um, so I thought that was kind of fascinating. Virginia City especially is kind of known as the hub, right? The social hub of Montana before Helena kind of eclipses it in the 1870s. Um, and little things like ice cream confections were really this representation of a world that a lot of miners and settlers in Montana had left behind. Um, and I find this really fascinating. If we really dig through the sources, a lot of times it's African American women who are doing that. Um, just a couple of examples. This is not an African American business. This is, I believe, German proprietors in Virginia City, which also tells us interesting things. But 1865, and you can see they're advertising an ice cream saloon. So already, 1865, they have figured out a way to make ice cream work. Um, right? Let no one tell you that Montanans are not ingenious at like figuring out those creature comforts early on. Um, and there's several cases, right? So here's Virginia City in 1866. You get an idea. This is still very much the frontier. This is very much a rough and tumble kind of a mining town. But in the midst of this, the ice cream saloons are up and running. Mm -hmm. We think about lots of other kinds of saloons. We don't often think about ice cream saloons <laughs> in the territory at this time. So just like find it really fascinating. Um, certainly the Wild West I grew up envisioning in my head when I was growing up did not include like walking down the street to get ice cream. So I love that twist in the story. Um, 
So we know that there's a couple of black women besides Sarah in Virginia City. Minerva Cogswell and Parthenia Sneed operate a boarding house um, for a long time. And just, you know, as another note, that building is actually still standing in Virginia City. It's not one of the ones that's been interpreted, but there is a lot of hope for preserving it. And this might be a new thing that's coming. Um, they say they're catering, right? Parties and weddings. Mm -hmm. um, this is 1877. That's right about the time that James Leonard Brown dies. So now I'm getting right a lot of pictures of this community. Um, and there's little snippets of them in the Madisonian that talk about, right? So here's ice cream and suitable refreshments on the 4th. So the 4th of July, the old International Hotel. Um, so it's one of my favorite ones. I didn't have a snippet of the newspaper just like on the computer I have with me to put the actual image in here, but in 1878, you'll see it's July, right? Minerva Cogswell marches herself down to the newspaper office in Virginia City with a bounteous supply of ice cream. And the editor just waxes poetic about this for a lot of lines how good this ice cream was. Um, and never mentions that they're black mentions that Minerva swung through and brought him some ice cream. He was really excited about it. Um, and so now we're back to this picture, right, of what I think about as the Wild West. You see in this last slide, right, ice cream and suitable refreshments at the Old International Hotel. This is the Old International Hotel right here in 1877. So again, really, right, this is horse-drawn wagons and kind of ramshackle sidewalks and false-fronted buildings, and it's all the things I think about being the Wild West, but with ice cream. <laughs> so, really quickly, just to wrap up, um, I'm working on a plan now. I think we need to have some good old, like, historic Montana ice cream that celebrates these African-American women. So I'm gonna start doing some research on flavors and things that might have been available. And I think this one's cool. So this is from the Helena Weekly Herald, 1878. It's advertising vanilla, lemon, etc. for flavoring ice cream, cakes, and pastry. And so we're back to that business and material culture, right? What kinds of things were they getting in Montana to flavor cakes and confectioneries and ice cream? Um, it shows Montana really being connected to this larger world. This is from Chicago and St. Louis, right? So there's literally some interaction there. Um, and then just really quickly, I have to always bring things back to Sarah Bickford. So she also is a purveyor of ice cream. As best I can tell, the first time she provided ice cream to Virginia City was actually at a meeting of the Montana Pioneers Association, of which her second husband, Stephen Bickford, is a part. Um, 1888, the Montana Pioneers Association meets on the 4th of July in Virginia City. And we know there's an ice cream saloon that's being set up for that. It seems like Sarah Bickford is running it. Um, and there's another note from the Madisonian in 1901 that says the hangman's building has served as all these different things, including a pill shop, reading room, post office, meat market, ice cream parlor, and half a dozen other things. So now I'm going to like, I don't know if that's Sarah in that building at that moment, but it could be. Just kind of, kind of fascinating. Fun things to think about. So just really quickly to wrap up, um, this is the one known image we have of Sarah or did for a long time. I could show you one more. Um, one of her grandchildren sent me some additional pictures of her after the book came out. Um, here's her second husband, Stephen. So you really do get a sense, like, you know, it's very much an interracial couple that found acceptance in Virginia City at that time. Um, and it's very much a pioneer story. Right? These are pioneers in every sense of the word. So I always want to make sure to honor that in the history, too. And here's 1899, just to give us a sense of a picture of the hangman's building, and they're not quite calling it that yet, the building in which the vigilantes hanged five men. This is 1899. Um, but Virginia City will start marketing that heritage-based tourism kind of right after the turn of the century. As tourism to Yellowstone opens up, 1890 we have the frontier declared closed, right? And all of a sudden it's this great moment of anxiety. 
um, for Americans. What are we going to do without a frontier? Uh, and automobile tourism. Right? Just all the, the literature and the pop culture and the movies and all the things. And you know, I want to pay homage to that here because that's very much the literature and the pop culture that inspired my grandpa. Right, to put himself on a horse and buy some cows and decide that he was going to be a cowboy. Um, it's the same Wild West that inspired me growing up as a kid, right? believing I could still be part of it in some way. So Sarah's attaching herself to that, and Virginia City is going to start marketing itself as the cradle of Montana's history, right? the place where history started because of the vigilantes because of these men who were brave enough to create civilization out of this wilderness. Um, and these are pictures that come from a Farm Securities Administration collection from 1939. This is one of the best pictures of the Hangman's Building I think we have. You can see here they're calling it the Hangman's Building, formally now. And these little signs down here, which are still in the building, they're still actually hanging up inside. Um, match the lettering on this water company office sign. And Elmer Bickford has actually signed one of these. So we know that that's happening in his tenure of the building. So untold history doesn't mean untellable history. It was hard to excavate Sarah's history out of all of this. And sometimes you know, our African-American pioneers and pioneers of other ethnic groups can get a little bit lost. but doesn't mean we can't tell those stories, we just have to kind of learn about them in some different ways. And I hope, if nothing else, Race in the Wild West inspires a lot of people that that's possible. And just those stories are out there. I love this quote by a guy named William McConnell, who is a contemporary of Sarah Bickford. Uh, I think this kind of sums it up. History is relentless. Once made, it cannot be unmade. Right? So, those things that happen are there for us to find in whatever way we can. Um, I'll leave you on a happy note. This is our wonderful living history actress striding into the Hangman's Building last September. Um, so the Extreme History Project in Bozeman is working on creating a documentary about four famous Montana women. Um, and Sarah Bickford's one of them. So this documentary will be out in a couple of weeks and hopefully will inspire some more people. Rose Hong Lee is included in it. There's actually quite a bit of stuff on view that'll be included in that documentary. So um, we'll leave it on a happy note. And I wanna end it there. I mean, I think this is such a powerful story just because what the Wild West gives us at the bottom of everything, right, is just like that vague and insistent belief that you can be something, right? That you can be someone. Um, and I'd like to think maybe I'm a little bit of a kindred spirit with Sarah there, right? She was never supposed to end up here, and this is one of the last pictures, I think, that was taken of her um, around 1929 or 1930, so not too terribly long before her death, one of her grandsons was generous enough and kind enough to send this to me. Um, and, you know, this is a woman who started off in slavery, who was supposed to be put on Schedule 2, but ended up on Schedule 1 and ended up in Montana and created this life for herself that was never expected of her when she was a little girl. And in some ways, that's kind of similar. I had different kinds of privileges than Sarah did on account of the way my race is perceived. Um, but I also grew up poor, in the middle of nowhere, without any of those expectations that I was ever gonna go to college or get a job at Oklahoma State University, <laughs> um, where I am pleased and happy to still be today. So uh, it's that powerful trajectory of the West, right? that open promise. So, I will end it there. Thank you so much. Please ask me anything. And I would love to sign some books. <laughs> Where is she buried? She is buried in Virginia City at the cemetery next to Stephen Bickford. Oh, so. And it's a very nice headstone. It's a big granite, well-marked headstone. 
There's another African American resident who lived there for a long time who's buried right next to her. And they're you know, just off, not too far from where the road agent's graves are, if you're curious about vigilante uh, history. Are the, are the children buried there too? The children, you know, so her four living children, the ones from the second marriage, all ended up in different places all over the country. I think Elmer might be buried in like Silver Star or Sheridan or something, oh, cool. one of those places. Um, her children from her first marriage, I was never able to find, and I assume they are in the Virginia City Cemetery in unmarked graves, and that would certainly be a thing we'd like to find at some point. Yeah. Were you ever able to locate any of the houses she lived in when she was there? Are they still? She probably didn't live in the same one all the time she was there, but are any of it still? Oh, this is exciting stay. news. So Sarah and Stephen lived in a house at the edge of town in Virginia City for a really long time. The house is still there. It's been changed a few times over the years, but it's been a residence for a long time. There's still people living there. I'm told they are renovating it now into an Airbnb. <coughs> Oh, so. Is that the lower end down by Nevada City end or the Ennis end? It's on the Ennis end. Okay. It's the little that, yellow that, that house. Road, oh, okay. The edge of the road. Mm -hmm. um, and I just learned, and this is not confirmed, I don't even know if I'm supposed to share, but I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> there's some ongoing research. We know that Sarah and Stephen lived in a cabin on Granite Creek for several years when they were first married. Um, their first child is born right about the time they move into Virginia City. And you can just imagine Sarah being like, mm -mm, no, <laughs> kids, like we're getting closer to town. Thank you. Um, and I had never really followed up on that because I just assume a little miner's cabin from the 1880s, what's still going to be there. Um, but there's some new research going on, and it sounds like actually they might have found the cabin and it might still be there. <gasps> So stay tuned for that story. I imagine there will be developments. And of course, yeah, um, the Hangman's building and then of course like her longtime ownership of that is hopefully going to be getting some additional preservation work in the next couple years. I know they're hoping to put in like a little museum of more specifically about her. So there's a lot of sites. Her first business and she's running her little bakery and cafe near the Wells Fargo office. So that building is still standing as well. Mm -hmm. so there's mm -hmm. some incredible African American history and Virginia City just hasn't necessarily been interpreted that way yet. Mm -hmm. Yet. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well thank you very much Laura. Thank you so much.